Um, so let's see, are there any questions? Um, I'm not clear how to get the factor of the metric in the thing we're supposed to derive for the second homework problem. But we can talk about that afterwards if we don't want to waste class time. Um, so all the homework's turned in, is that it? And I should well, did anyone do the second part of the homework? <laughs> did you? <laughs> I wrote that for Richard is crap. I mean, I know how to, I sort of know how to do it, but I, I can't, I don't know where the factor of the metric comes in. Because you have this, you have Q squared, eta mu nu, and then you have a minus Q mu Q nu. Right. But this is the thing, this is the contribution to the pi star you're supposed to get from this, this counter term. And I get the Q squared, but I don't get the metric eta mu nu. I wasn't sure where that came from. All right, so let me, let me, I haven't actually done the problem. <laughs> um, let me um, look at what the answer is supposed to be now. Um, so I can tell you. Talking about basically equation eleven two fifteen. That sounds right. Right. And <coughs> so the question is, um,
And so well, we get a factor of two there, so it's so it looks like that. And um, and the reason we're doing this is that we're comparing this with the rest of the contribution um, to this. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Um, right, okay. So we're doing the contribution to the contribution. We're comparing it with that term, and that term would have Q coming in. I mean, we already did this basically in class. Q going out, and then we have D4 X1, D4 X2, and then we have psi bar, A slash psi, psi bar, A slash psi, basically. And um, the, the A's. Um, give, give these two pieces and then the size give these two pieces and that's that integral and um, so we're certainly going to get something like Q mu and then uh, we're going to have these epsilons, of course, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if we forget, we sort of, I'm going to get very sloppy now. Um, we sort of have this minus Q nu epsilon mu here, and then over here, Q mu. So it's essentially that, and um, the epsilons. So, yes. yeah, I, I figured that we the, sum all the polarizations. So the metric is going to come from some sort of completeness relation among the the spins, the, the polarizations. I guess so. Um, Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the clearly Q mu, Q mu is going to give us Q squared, and then this is going to... I mean, what I don't understand is there's no, there's no indices left over in this expression, because everything's summed over. Yeah, you're right. So why is there an index in the... <laughs> right. Um, it's, well, it's, it, it, it must come from, you see, in, in order to in order to do the problem, you have to compare what you get from first order with what you get from second order. And then the sec in the second order term, we've, we've factored out various things. You have to factor out the same things over here. And when you do that, um, it's uh, then this this is the analog of of the thing we were calculating. Okay. Um, since I didn't do the thing ahead of time, I I guess it'd be better for me to do this. I'll, I'll look at the tonight solutions. or tomorrow, and I'll put it on the, yeah. on the web page. Um, but it may, it may be that over here you factor out something that I mean certainly you've got indices here. Yeah. And so they come from what you're saying about this. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's, it's not obvious just looking at it. All right, let me get to what I was going to talk about today, namely um, an example which can be called your cow's example. Um, this was back, I think, in the as far back as the 30s, 
Um, and Yukawa suggested that the, the potential between baryons was something like e to the minus mu r over 4 pi r. And there were some experiments on, well, something people knew a certain amount about nuclear physics, and there were some early experiments. Um, and so the, the idea was that two neutrons might attract each other with this sort of a potential. And so he suggested that in an, in, by analogy to a photon going across, which gives a 1 over r squared force, if you had instead a, a particle of a mass of around, I don't know how accurately he predicted it, but, but if you have the pion is around 140 MeV, then you have for, of, of, then you have a force that looks like this, and the potential looks like this. So the force uh, is at very short distances, it's kilometer but it's exponentially suppressed at distances beyond the Compton wavelength of the pion, which is around um, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, 10 to the minus 15 meters, and this is called a Fermi. Okay, so the question is, uh, I mean, last time we were talking about poles and scattering amplitudes, and the question is, how, uh, how does your countless example fit in? And um, so let's think about a scattering amplitude Q1, Q4, which is an integral d4 of x1, d4 of x4, e to the minus i, qi, xi sum from 1 to 4, and then a time-ordered product of psi bag at x1, psi x2, psi bag at x3, psi x4, and um, back in. And I'm thinking of this as, I'm sort of vague, you can think of this as quarks, or you can think of this as as baryons, so two protons, two neutrons, a proton and a neutron. So you have this field side represent any of those. Of course, a baryon is essentially three quarks. All right, so then I'm going to focus on the part that is the same thing, d4 of x1, d4 of x4, d minus i, qi, xi, I'm going to look at this part, time order product, psi dagger x1, psi x2, uh, a one particle state, um, another time ordered product, psi dagger x3, psi x4, vacuum, and um, this would be the case for um, in, in, in which x1 and x2 are later than x3 and x4. And the idea is that this is a pi meson state. Um, and in fact, we should be integrating over <coughs> dqp and um, what one, we, we went through the analysis of this last time and we showed that this should be proportional to delta fourth of Q1 plus Q4 over Q1 plus Q2 squared plus m pi squared minus i epsilon near, uh, near this pole. Uh, now, if, if the, the thing looks like this, Q1, Q, what am I doing? Q1, Q2, yeah, I guess that's right. Um, Q3, uh, 
3Q4. If it looks like this, then um, you can't have this equal to minus m pi squared. So you don't actually hit the pole. On the other hand, m pi is, is pretty small. It's the lightest hadron. And um, so you can arrange for this uh, square of momenta to be close to zero, and then you just have m pi. And so you're near the pole. You're not actually on the pole. Um, and if you imagine that, um, that the that Q1, here we're talking about basically low energy scattering, and that this is less than m pi, and that Q2 is much less than m pi, then um, the, the energy transfer, uh, that is to say, um, Q10 plus Q20 in absolute value, and in fact, you could even say, well, not minus, no, uh, plus Q0 um, is of the order of um, Q1 squared minus Q2 squared over 2 uh, m pi. And so, in other words, the, tra the energy transfer. It, it, the, the energy term here you can ignore at low, low momentum. And here, you see, I put in all the Qs with the same sign. That means that two of them have the unphysical sign. If we go, if we go instead to the physical ones, so in other words, the way I've written it, they're all either going in or all going out the way I've written the Q's. If we write the P's, on the other hand, then it's P2, P1, and it looks like this. Well, what's the difference between P's and Q's now? Um, the, I don't remember which one is unphysical, okay? But, so, um, but, but, uh, unphysical in what sense? Well, no. If it's a scattering amplitude, you'd have you'd either have the out. Let me give you one way. I don't know which way the sign is. I have to work the thing out. But let us say that the outgoing physical ones have a minus sign here. Then the incoming ones have a plus sign up here. So, so what is what 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 is the sign? In other, word, in other, word, in other words, let, let, let's assume that the, that that the sign dimension I gave you is the right one. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, then, which ones are going out? One and three. Then Q one is P one. Q three is P three. Q two is minus P two. Q four is minus P four. And the P's are all what we think of as physical. That is to say, the energy is positive. And the three momentum is the direction of the three momentum. Whereas, oh, so this, is the, the, this is the positive energy constraint that we're worried about. So it's the, the right sign in the, the 4A decomposition? So yes. You don't have negative yes, energy states? Yes, yes, the right sign in the, in the, in the 4 that has decomposition. Um, okay, so if we if we do that, then this 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 scattering amplitude near the pole looks like the delta function, and now it would be what did we say was well, it doesn't matter. The thing is even p one plus p three minus p two minus p four. That's the way it would, if I've got that. We have that, and now we would have P1 minus P2 squared plus M1 squared. And these are just three momenta. So that's what it looks like. 
And um, it turns out that if we multiply this by minus 2 pi cubed, and this, in fact, is equal to an integral d4 of x1, d4 of x, no, d cubed. d cubed x1 prime, d cubed x2 prime. Well, it's too bad I changed the numbers. <laughs> um, actually, Weinberg changed it. So let me do three and four. e to the minus i x1 p1 
think I'm going to follow the notes in a slightly backward way. So let's consider actually a simpler structure, which is just e4 of x1, e4 of x2, e to the minus i, qi, xi, i going from 1 to 2, time ordered product, and I'm going to call this uh, AL of x1, AM, x2, back, okay. And because there's an L and M, I guess I should put an L and M over here. Okay. Um, now, if there's a particle that couples, in other words, such that P A L of X1 vacuum is non-zero, some one particle state. And as Weinberg emphasizes, the the idea here is there's a particle here that is part of that, that forms part of a sum of a complete set of states. This particle may not have anything to do with the fields of the theory. And in particular, in the case of a pion, um, in QCD, there isn't any fields for the pion. There are fields for the quarks and the gluons. All right. Okay, so, that, so, so then, if there is such a one particle state, then this is approximately minus 2i square root of q1 three vector squared plus m squared, where m is the mass of this state, over q1 squared plus m squared minus i epsilon, so the four vector squared, a 2 pi cubed, and then the sum over spins 0, AL of 0, and now this turns out to be Q1 and S, say, and then integral P4 of X2 e to the minus I Q2 X2 Q1 S AM X2 0. So that's Basically, it, and by the way, there's something that um, uh, what you Tom? Huh? Tom? Tom. Uh, Tom pointed out in class last time, namely that I hadn't explained why we had this term up here. Remember, the way we the way we got the denominator is that we rationalized an energy difference. That gives us up here minus i q one zero minus i the square root. And so near the pole, which is when q10 is this square root, near the pole, this term dominates. And when, when we're near the pole, then we can replace q10 with just the square root. So that's the idea. I forgot to say that. Okay, so this is what it's like near the pole, and um, we expect that zero a l of zero q one of s is some normalization constant two pi to the three halves. UL of Q1 and S. So this UL is the thing that's a four spinner in the case of the Dirac field. It's instead, it's um, UL of Q1 and S is just one over the square root of two Q10 in the case of a scalar field. And the L index is superfluous. This N is effectively one of the Z's. In other words, um, and, and in fact, what we'll be saying is if this field is the renormalized field, then this n should be 1. So, for, uh, if renormalized. Okay. 
And what is this integral here? Well, this integral, let me go over here to save space. It's integral d4 of x2 e to the minus i q2 x2 q1 and s a m of x2 zero. Okay. Well, this a m of x2, of course, <clears throat> we can write as e to the minus i the full momentum operator x2 a m of zero e to the i p x2 and this was just the vacuum. P on the vacuum is zero. P on this state is Q1. And so this is integral d4 of x2 e to the minus i Q2 x2 minus i Q1 x2. Q1 s a n of zero, zero. And this thing gives you two pi to the fourth delta 4 of q1 plus q2. q1 s a n of 0, 0. And I think I missed what approximation we made in the top line here. So we, we pulled out the al of x1. Which top line? So we this did top the, line here? We did the x1 integration somehow. Uh, yeah, what I was what I was actually using was this this whole shtick that we did last time, where we, we what we did was we inserted a state. We said there was a state here, Q one S. So just this, so we're not summing over it. Or well, we're integrating it. over its three moments. So we are integrating over the three moments. Okay. And we're also taking Q one near that pole. Okay, and that's why we get the right. And so Q one is near the pole. And then this thing near that pole is this. Okay. And um, by the same token, using this formula, what we get is n star over 2 pi to the 3 halves u star m of q1 and s, again 2 pi to the 4th delta 4th of q1 plus q2. Okay, so the whole thing, which is to say this, is approximately near the pole minus 2i square root of q1 squared plus m squared over q1 squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. Absolute value of n squared, and this is the thing we want, 1 for the renormalized fields. Sum on the spins ul of q1 and s um star q1 and s, and then this factor of 2 pi to the fourth, which I should have written in the beginning. But anyway, 2 pi to the fourth, delta the fourth, q1 plus q2. Okay, so this is the whole expression. Now, what I want to, um, well, let's just look at this in the, in the simpler case of, um, in which these guys are just one over um, twice the energy, one over the square root of twice the energy, then this would be minus 2i square root of q10 effectively. Then that would give us 2 q10. And then we would have q1 squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And, and then a pi to the fourth, delta fourth, one plus two. So apart from the two pi to the fourth and the two and the um, the 
the other thing, this is um, minus i over square root of q1, 0, divided by four, the delta function, and then q1 squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. So apart from a couple of factors, it's the propagator. Right. Now, let's, let's recall more generally what the propagated is. And um, basically, the idea is minus i delta Lm of x and y for a general field, any field, it's psi L of x, psi m dagger of y, vacuum. And remember, the time-ordered product here, um, we're thinking of a time-ordered product that is um, that has a built-in minus sign if it's a fermion field. So this thing turns out to be theta of x0 minus y0, psi positive frequency L of x, psi positive frequency dagger M of y, commutator if it's a boson, anti-commutator if it's a fermion, plus or minus, wait a minute, yeah, plus or minus, theta of y0 minus x0, negative frequency, vaga, m, y, negative frequency, l, x, minus plus. And this is also minus i integral d fourth q over 2 pi to the fourth. Some PLM of q, e to the i q x minus y over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. So that propagator has this form where, well, if you do these commutators or anti-commutators, you get product of deltas and delta functions, which cut down the momentum, cut down one of the momentum integrals, leaving you with, with, with one. You have two momentum integrals because you have two fields. You get down to one, and then you have um, the, spinner, the spinners left over from the two fields. And you also have the theta function, which you can write as, an, as a frequency integral. When you're all done, you get this, where PLM of Q is equal to 2 square root of Q vector squared plus M squared sum on S UL of Q and S UM star of Q and S. So in other words, in other words, the renormalized propagator in the propagator in momentum space is minus i delta L M of in this play case Q1. It's a minus i P N M of Q1 over q1 squared plus m squared minus i epsilon, and it's a minus there. And that means it's minus 2i square root of q1 squared plus m squared sum on s ul of q and s u star m of q and s, and this is q1 in this case. So that's the PL, and then um, it involves this. In other words, we divide by Q1 squared plus M squared minus I epsilon. Now if you compare this with this, you see it's the same thing apart from this term, which we're excluding, and the N. But if the field is renormalized, the N is 1. Okay. So that means that that uh, that this thing here is, if the fields are renormalized, this is the propagator that we want. 
and at least near the pole, it's the propagator that we want. And um, so that, that tells us that um, the normalized propagator um, has uh, a pole at q squared is minus m squared with unit residue. So and again, unit residue ignoring the 2i, the square root, and the spinners, all right? So unit residue means n equals 1. And the n equals 1 also comes from just saying the field is renormalized because then um, this n goes to 1. Okay. Well, now um, I'm just going to go through some stuff that you've already seen, but this renormalization is so kind of confusing, probably because it's. It's what? I said illegitimate. Ah. Um, what I mean is, it's what we're doing. The justification of this renormalization is to say this physics at high energy, at short distances that we don't understand, and we're representing that by these, these counter terms. And, um, the string theory may be completely wrong, but at least it's an attempt to have a finite theory. Okay, so in general, this phi b with some state q is um, n u of q, or u of q over 2 pi to the 3 halves. And in fact, since I'm talking about a scalar field, it's silly. It's just n over square root of 2 pi q, 2 q 0. And um, I was calling it n because of that, but we also call it, um, we typically call it square root of z uh, over 2 pi q, 2 q 0. So that is that we normalized field. So we're going to be setting phi b equal to square root of z times the root of the, phi, the field phi, and in that case, we can, in that case, we get 0 phi q is just 1 over square root of 2 pi q, 2 q 0. This is the scalar case. And um, we're also setting m squared, e mb squared equal m squared minus delta m squared. And then this L here is L0 plus L1. The L0 is the one we've been using when doing perturbation theory. C mu phi, C mu phi minus a half m squared phi squared. By the way, let me just mention something that I, I may have taken for granted in earlier lectures. Um, this thing is what we call the renormalized mass. And so if we're doing symmetry breaking, spontaneous symmetry breaking, we look in the Lagrangian and we have a scale of field. We look for the Lagrangian for a term that looks like this. And we say that's the mass. And in the case of a, a vector field, it also looks the same. That's for a real field. For a complex field, so half goes away because of the way we normalize things. L1 is minus a half z minus 1 d mu v d mu v plus m squared p squared and a half z delta m squared p squared minus v of square root of z. 
that's because that's the way we wrote that. We haven't bothered to deconstruct this term. I never thought I'd say deconstruct. All right, so if we're actually computing, say, the self-energy of the pion, so we're trying to figure out what this might be, or how, I mean, of course, we're, we don't, we never try, I, I, I misspoke, we don't really try to figure out what this is, because um, we say that whatever it is, it just, um, it, it's just such that, mb squared, which we don't know, plus dollar m squared, which we don't know, is the m squared, which we do know. But in any event, what we'd be doing is, um, in a phi cube theory, we'd be computing graphs like that. In a phi fourth theory, we'd be comparing graphs like that, and then higher terms. And the point is, we're looking at graphs that are, so to speak, one particle irreducible, so one p typically people use capital letters, I don't know why. Anyway, one particle irreducible, which means that we're not talking about things like this, because this is one particle irreducible. You cut it in you mean separate it by cutting one line. It's one particle reducible. That's right, it's one particle reducible. How many chocolates do I own? Do I own one of the chocolates? I don't know. I'll, I'll give one when I leave. All right. So the uh, lowest order propagator, of course, is 1 over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. And then if we look at these things, we'll say that the, the full propagator delta prime is the ordinary propagator plus the propagator, the one particle irreducible propagator, and in fact, plus these higher terms. And that corresponds to this, di this diagram. In 5-4, it would look like this. Well, you see, the point is, this is not just this diagram. Right, it has the counter diagrams like this. This is the counter terms too, right? That pi star? If we're talking about the full propagator, that's right, that's right. Pi star has the counter terms also. Right, absolutely. Anyway, so we would have this plus Anyway, this is what this thing looks like. And so that's equal to delta sum pi star delta to the n from 0 to infinity, which is delta 1 over 1 minus pi star delta, which is 1 over, um, well, delta inverse minus pi star. And so delta prime then is 1 over, let me get my other notes, one out of these notes. All right, so, so, I'm only have a single field. so let's see, who, um, let's see, I owe you a choice, who else has one? How many other questions do we have? Oh, yeah, you have you must have asked a question. Okay, you talk about anything. I think you would just yes. don't want and, and he made thing. the observation at the end of last class that we should have asked you this question. So All right. In this, so in this scalar theory, we have only a single field, right? We have this we sorry. have this phi field. So yes. how do we distinguish uh, and the, the one particle irreducible diagrams are going to, the way they look are going to depend on the potential, right? Absolutely. And yeah. so my question is, how do, how do you distinguish the one particle reducible diagrams from higher yeah. orders of one particle irreducible diagrams? Right? Because the, the only lines are, are, are the phi field. 
So when you draw a line... All the lines are five fields. Right, right, right. So how do I just... How, how come this second order, for instance, here... How why come, is... This is, a redu right. this is one particle reducible. So why? Uh, couldn't I cut through the one middle? The, that's why it's reducible. It's what oh, that one is out. reducible. Yes. So then that shouldn't make a contribution to the, to the pi star, because we're not calculating those things. Or are we calculating those things? Well, we're calculating the full propagator. Oh, so we are including those things. Yes. So we were including then even... But they're not part of pi star. Oh, each pi star is one of them. This is pi star. Diagrammatically, right. this is pi star. Right. This is one particle I see. reduced. Irreducible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then we have propagator, irreducible, propagator, irreducible, irreducible yeah. propagator. This is reducible. Got it. But we have to include it. Got it. And all right, I'm just I'm just starting to think about what if we had this? Well, all right, no, I, I, I let me not go there. All right, so this thing is q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon times one over one minus pi star over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. I'm just multiplying through. We get one over. Q squared plus m squared plus pi star of q squared minus i epsilon. So that's what the whole propagator is. And now as we've gone through this whole derivation over there, what we know is that we want this to be effectively 1 over q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon near Q squared equals minus m squared. So it has a pole at Q squared equals minus m squared, and up in the numerator you have a 1. And so that means that pi star of, and this is the renormalized mass, so pi star of minus m squared is 0, and d pi star d q squared at q squared minus m squared is zero. So in other words, if we expanded pi star in a power series in q squared, the first term would be q to the fourth, or q squared squared. Then that would be okay. We'd still have a pole at minus m squared unit residue. Now, if we do the analog of the homework problem, but for the scalar field, and I kind of did this in class. Yeah, I did. More or less did it in class. It's easy for this. There's less indices. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I assumed it was, I, I assumed the homework problem was almost as easy as the one I did in class. But I didn't, I didn't actually do it, and I'll have to do it, as I said, tonight or tomorrow night. Anyway, if you if we do it, we get minus 1, minus z minus 1, q squared plus m squared, plus z delta m squared. These are first order terms. This is first order perturbation theory. And then we get plus pi star loop of q squared from second order. This is first order. And now we want to say, if we only compute up to second order, what is the thing? By the way, this, let me try to, let me demystify, or, or just make this a little more concrete, what this is. And again, apart from these, the, 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 the convention of renormalization is that you either include or don't include the final, um, the final propagators and so forth. So I'm going to, blow that part away. Let's assume it's phi cube theory, in which case it's this. That's the one particle, the second order one particle irreducible. In other words, this is pi star loop. So if you have a phi 4 theory, is it still true that this loop diagram is second order? Like, does the second order Yeah, 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 it's still second order. Does the second order here come from the number of vertices you have? Yes. But in a phi 4 theory, you would... In the 5-4 theory, all right, this is 5 cubed. 
and it's this and and in phi fourth looks like this. Okay. Okay. This one is the integral. It, it's it, call this p and call this q. Okay. So this is an integral b fourth p. This propagator is one over p squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. But this propagator is what? Well, we're going like that, and so uh, all right. Here, this thing is q, and so this is p minus q squared plus m squared minus i epsilon. So that's and but there are two vertices. So it's lambda squared. So apart from two pi's, propagators, delta functions, and other things, pi's, it's basically this. And then you can see what you're going to do is you're going to do the Feynman trick to rationalize it. You're going to do a wick rotation, and then you dimension your rotoroids. And in that case, then, you use these guys to cancel the poles at d equal 4, which reappear when you bring d back to 4. And so, what 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 you get then is after you computed this we know this this integral in terms of gamma functions, um, you then say z of m squared is minus pi star of minus m squared and um, z is equal to one plus d d q squared. Of pi star at q squared minus m minus m squared. Okay, that means that both of these guys are of order lambda squared in in the phi cube theory and lambda squared in the phi four theory. Do you want me to write down what the integral is in phi four? No. It's it has three propagators in the denominator, three propagators, and but two d fourth integrations because you have two two more to the integrator, um, which makes it more divergent than phi cube. On the other hand, phi cubed is manifestly sick because the Hamiltonian has phi cubed in it. And you can let phi have a mean value in the vacuum that's negative and large, and that drives the uh, energy to minus infinity. Or if the sign is the opposite, then you put in, uh, you let phi have a positive mean value, then that mean. anyway, it's unboundable or either way. Okay, so in the Dirac case, L is uh, minus psi baryon d psi bar d slash plus m six baryon it's bare uh, minus v b of of this and we say psi b is square root of z two psi m b is m minus delta m and we do the same business. L equals L0 plus L1. This is L, of course. And then L0 is um, the thing we've been using to do perturbation theory. And L1 is minus Z2 minus 1 psi bar D psi plus M psi plus z2 delta m sub bar psi and then minus vb of z2 psi bar psi. Then the the self energy um, is then um, 
minus z2 minus 1 i k slash plus m plus z2 delta m. So these are the first order terms. And then plus sigma star loop. Um, and one can think of it as a function of k squared if you want. Um, this thing is the one the i part. And um, you then do the same business that this. So this uh, is when you have a fermion, two fermion external lines, right? Well, frankly, this this example was was chosen. Um, Weinberg kind of uh, didn't do this one in detail. The, you, 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 but still, what the one pi i, one pi diagrams are depends upon what this is. Yeah, and um, you, you. Uh, so this depends on the vacuum polarization calculation. Is what you're saying? Yeah, effective. I mean, it depends on what the interaction is with right. the, the that makes this theory a, uh, a an interactive field theory. In the, in the vacuum. If, for for it, right, let, 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 let me let me give an example. Let me give an example. Um, we could say that VB is some phi b psi bar psi g, g a coupling constant, uh, phi a scalar field. It turns out if you do that, you have to add in this term. Very, very curiously, if I'm not mistaken, um, I, so I, did you, I haven't looked at this in a long time, but I think in order to make the thing renormalizable, you have to add in this term. But, um, okay, anyway, that's, that's a side. But my question we, was, we calculated the vacuum polarization. We had two external gauge field lines. Right. Here, here, we're, kind of here we're just talking about, or here, we're just talking about a single fermion. And now, what would it be? It would be a single fermion, um, and it would emit. This term would give rise to something, a loop diagram like this. But the point is the external lines are fermion lines. Yes. Okay. That's, that's my question. Sorry. It would be look, look, look like this. Right. And you've also got that term. Well, that term would contribute to lowest order. Wouldn't there still be a two, a second order, a two vertex thing with that? Not with a fermion. So why not? Because. <laughs> um, well, let's see. I mean, the only thing that would come close. I guess is it, is it charge conservation? Is that good? No, 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 no. It's just it's just simple combinatorics. The the you see two factors of this give you this diagram, right? Because mm -hmm. the you you have the incoming fermion absorbed by psi, emitted by psi bar, and then the second vertex absorbed by psi, emitted by psi bar. But in each vertex, you the first vertex you emit a, 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 a scalar boson, and you absorb it in the second vertex. If you if you had two of these, you'd have no way to to so deal with a no way to deal with the fermion line. So at first order, though, I mean, doesn't this say that a vertex could have four? Oh, this is, this is five. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's the wrong field. Yeah. Never mind. The thing that psi bar psi squared, the reason I didn't write that down is that's not renormalizable. Mm. And if you put two of these, if you put this together with that, um, you've got an odd number of Bose fields and there's no way to make that um, work. Right? Okay, so anyway, so what you'd have in this theory would be this plus this plus, and I guess it might just be this simple. Um, well, 
the fact is that, that in, in higher order, this would play a role because you can have a diagram that would look like this. Right. Like that. And uh, that would contribute. So this is part of sigma star um, um, loop. But that's still second order in G. So it depends on which order. This would be, uh, yeah, this would be second order in G and second order in lambda. Mm -hmm. Okay, in any event. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Um, I was a boy on the radio, the cowboy shows on the radio. Every half hour or so, someone would say, meanwhile, back at the ranch. Okay, so what is this um, full, uh, this full fermion, um, this full, actually, I, I think I wrote that equation wrong. Well, anyway, let me see. Z, anyway, we get Z2 minus 1, I k slash plus m, um, plus Z2 delta m, plus sigma star loop of k slash. And, um, and the renormalized propagated here is then 1 over i k slash plus m minus sigma star of k slash minus i epsilon. And so what we do is we say, We say that, see, we want this to look like just 1 over i k slash plus m minus i epsilon near k squared plus minus m squared. And so what we say is that sigma star of i m is 0 and the, deri the, the, the derivative of sigma star, this is sigma star loop. Um, with respect to k. Oh, no, this is the full sigma star. This is sigma star. This is this sigma star. And not Okay, so let me get this straight. Right. So, all right, I better rewrite this. It should definitely be the full. Well, yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's both of them. I, I, sigma star of I am, I, what I wrote down was right. And k slash equals I am really just means k squared equals minus m. Then what we get is that z2 delta m is minus sigma star loop of I am and Z2 is 1 minus I partial sigma star loop of K slash partial K slash and K slash is I am, which as I said, just means that it's all the mashup. Oh my god, we're over time. Uh, sorry. I didn't mean that. Uh, So does anybody need a chocolate?